let's try to answer the question what actually a green startup means. Uh, we're talking about startups, um, we hear more and more about sustainability. Someone calls it green startup, someone sustainable startup. So could you maybe just a bit explain to, to the audience uh, what, what we mean with, with a green startup? Um, I mean, from, from my perspective, and I'm happy that there's an expert who might correct me after, I would probably prefer the, you know, the terminology of green startup because sustainable at the end of the day means that it's, it can be sustainable from a lot of point of views. It can also be economically sustainable, mm. but then it doesn't necessarily mean that it's green. So from a green startup, I would probably define it as, an, as a business that is in the very early steps of its operational business. I don't know if there's a time frame, but you know, at the, at the beginning, let's say. And it has an idea that evolves around how to address climate change. Um, or how to, to find solutions to increase the use of renewable energy, for instance. Um, yeah, and, and you know, when it comes to climate change, obviously that could be adaptation or mitigation. So adaptation to climate change, um, you know, how you can make your environment more resilient, mm -hmm. and mitigation, obviously, how can you decrease um, fossil fuel emissions mm -hmm. and, you know, give power to more renewable solutions. That's my take on the definition but happy so you to see yours. <laughs> so you see as the initial idea which should like be the driver of creating a startup is saying how can i tackle also the climate change so there should be like this climate uh thing behind me deciding to create whatever startup and come with my idea i should look at it from the perspective what for impact it does have for for the climate this can be one angle and then the other one could be yeah, how can I really, um, not, it's not about tackling the climate change, but maybe to understand how can I disrupt the system which is now in place, for example, as we see the energy system, saying let's go for some innovative solution and in invest in really like a research and development to really come with a totally new thing, new solution. So not just to say, okay, I will now create an app for reducing a waste, but this is the one way we can go with startups. And the other one could be, yeah, but let's come with something totally new and innovative and breakthrough. Um, yeah, so this is just reflecting that I, I actually am also align uh, with, with your idea about what a green startup means. But yeah, what, what Christian, are you also with us on board? <laughs> um, Do you have a different uh, view? Um, generally, I'm um, aligned, but um, maybe I go back to um, my two de general definitions of green startups. So one I see is a startup that thrives to be as resource and energy efficient as possible as an organization and obviously as long as this is uh, still cost efficient and this definition can be applied to any startup irrespective of the industry or market um, or whatever differentiator is applied for defining this um, startup but these startups obviously can also produce goods that are not more sustainable or more climate friendly than other products but at least there is a saving. Mm -hmm. So this is the internal green startup. And the second definition that I see this is a startup that focuses on making the way we produce and consume goods and services as resource efficient as possible and then also less climate and environmentally harming as possible. And again, it has to be achieved with... Um, so, um, a cost base that is still economically viable. And uh, strictly speaking, these startups could be internally not very resource efficient, but they will have the scaling effect with the products and services and the impact they have on the lives. So it's a bit counterintuitive um, to discern these two uh, dimensions, but I think these are both right. For example, some services just require a certain amount of energy mm and resource use, but if at least the operation that provides these services is green, then um, there's also a positive impact. But uh, I agree that the general um, accepted, um, generally accepted definition of a green startup is a startup that deals with making our life more resource efficient and less harmful for the environment. 
So being green also inside the own startup. So yeah. people working there and all the products and services should always be uh, in line with trying to really yeah. use as, as few energy as possible. Uh, and, and this also has a scaling effect mm -hmm. if the uh, employees get used to this and tell about this. That this is more a grassroots thing. Yeah. But it can... Um, be done with economically very viable startups that do um, normal business. Uh, Anya, from uh, Africa, not like say from global south perspective, where you see a real need in which sector or area to focus on investing and only supporting startups? Where you see their like role? Is there any specific sector where you see it's really necessary for Africa to develop to invest in innovative ideas? And solutions? Um, yes, definitely. Uh, I, I think one sector that clearly stands out is the so-called climate smart agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, and that might sound a bit strange for from the Global North perspective, but you see around 60 to 65 percent of um, the GDP created in African countries does still come from agriculture, meaning mm. that most of the people work in agriculture. And if you see, you know, the global food crisis, um, malnourishment, that is clearly something that needs to be addressed because mm -hmm. agriculture will be there and will, will remain also in the future. But the terminology climate smart agriculture means that it's an agriculture that greening the agriculture uh, in itself, mm -hmm. so it uses um, it uses less resources. For example, not so much of the um, ordinary. Um, fertilizers, you know, um, and at the same time becomes resilient to, um, to climate uh, change uh, events. And it doesn't sound very exciting, probably mm. it's not uh, rocket science, but it's something that definitely needs to be addressed. Mm. And we, we did a lot of work with um, young entrepreneurs that work in climate uh, smart agriculture in the past, and they also say that one of the challenges they have that One of them actually said, so I'm quoting, <laughs> it's not very sexy. Mm. A lot of young people in rural areas in Africa want to go to the big cities. They want to work in IT. Um, they, they don't really want to work in agriculture, but it is absolutely needed. And mm. so the question is, how can we make this business more sexy, more attractive? Mm. Um, and that is obviously using some level of, of technology um, and at the same time making it more resilient to climate change. Um, and also making it, of course, more efficient, that you get more out of it, because it's not a problem in African countries. The output in the Afri in agriculture is not very high. Yeah? So that, that means, basically, if you look at um, the output you get per hectare square of crops, it's much um, mm -hmm. lower than in industrialized countries. Um, so, yeah, that is one area that, that definitely um, needs to be looked into. And A lot of things have been have been done. I mean, for example, I came across a young startup some years ago that developed drone technology um, for agriculture. So the drone basically delivers pictures that um, can measure the level of droughtness of the field. So the farmer knows exactly where he should use water uh, and where he shouldn't. And that obviously saves water mm. um, and, and is very helpful and can, you know... Uh, increase the, the level of, of productivity. So these are very small examples. Um, they're probably not revolutionary, but nevertheless, they're, they're very much needed. Mm. And CAS in Africa, you alone, um, you also work with startups, right? You, you create some programs and mm -hmm. also kind of capacity building activities. Could you just briefly talk about what, what CAS plays uh, for a role in, in this? So, so I think... When you look at you know probably the you know the conditions for startups in in Africa compared to Europe is it di more difficult is it easier? Um, I would say to some extent it's easier and that's probably also a philosophical question. So the lack of regulations, the lack of mm. frameworks, can to some extent be helpful um, to just try out something new, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and don't don't kill the idea at the beginning by I don't know. <laughs> 500 pages of regulation. Yeah, um, for, for instance, we 
you know, in, in Kenya where, where we are based, there, there's a lot in this moment, um, you know, talking about how to do, how to apply circular economy models. And there's this guy, and he basically, um, yeah, he, I don't know if you say, like, sm he smelters plastics. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he heats them to a very high degree so they become liquid. And then he, he builds, um, you know, material, uh, you know, bricks for houses. Uh, you know, to kind of reuse the, the plastic. I don't think that would be possible in, in Europe without, I don't know, how many ISO standards and how many rules and regulations. Um, so, so this lack of absence can also be an inspiration of, um, of creativity. Of course, a lot of the problems that you have are coming from the absence of framework and institutions. So it's a two-folded two mm. coin, I would say. Um, one of the main challenges that those startups have is you know that there are no facilities as we might have in Europe that support startups, especially from the financial point of view. Mm. It's incredibly hard for them sometimes to get a license, especially if the idea is new and has not been heard of. Some startups reported that sometimes they have to, if they want to rent, I don't know, uh, you know fabric or something, they sometimes need to pay upfront the rent for two years. Who has that money uh, if, if you just... Mm started the company. So I think that is one of the challenges, that they're not really programs that support also financially startups, um, you know, any tax regulations that say, you know, if you are in the green area, in the clean area, um, you don't need to pay income taxes for one year or so. Obviously, you also have to obviously take into consideration that the fiscal space is very limited in African countries. Mm. Um, but what we did with startups was to, to help them develop, developing, and we work a lot with startups in the climate smart agriculture, to really develop them, to help develop their business plans. Mm -hmm. um, we are not in the position to say you should do this or that, because we don't have the creativity, and I think it needs to really come from the people that are facing situations everyday life. So a lot of those startups are not um, professional, you know, startup they're not in the startup community. Sometimes, you know, they're farmers, they see a problem, a challenge, and they want to address it. Or this, this guy that I, I previously mentioned who invented, invented the drone technology or, you know, applied in this local community, he was a computer engineer. So he's neither a farmer nor does he have the business know-how. And a lot of people think, okay, this is a great idea and we're going to implement it. But they never have learned that they need a business plan, that they need to think... Uh, who is their market uh, sector? Mm. Who are they going to expand the business? And, and they don't know technical things, financial aspects. They don't really know that. So we try to provide that um, by working together with, with experts that are helping startups, kind of incubators. I mean, we can always do that on, only on a very s small mm. scale. But, you know, when I speak to this young startups and also to, to professionals that... Uh, help to support startups in Africa, they say this value of death after the idea and then is the idea really going to expand, is it to thrive, the business is very, very high because mm -hmm. people just come there and don't have any idea how they want to do it, they just have a great idea but there's no, there's lack of experience, lack of knowledge and then the idea dies unfortunately at a very early stage of the startup and this is something that we are, that we're trying to address and also um, I mean, being a regional program, obviously, one of the advantages is that we can facilitate and support peer-to-peer -peer learning. Mm -hmm. So the last event that we that we had, um, we had startups, young startups from the from the agricultural sector from over twenty countries, and one of the result was afterwards that they actually connected to each other and you know helped each other out, kind of did mentoring. Some of them expanded their little markets to the neighboring countries because they finally had a sparing partner in the other countries. Mm -hmm. um, because it is also something that we forget. You know, Africa, uh, the regional integration in Africa is very low. So it's not, you know, you drive, you take a train, and you drive from one country to another. You very often have not heard uh, what is going on in your neighboring country. Mm -hmm. If you have some level of education, you've probably been to Europe. But, you know, if you are in Burkina Faso, chances are very high. You've never been to Senegal. You've never been to Mali. Um, and, and that is obviously something that we can, we can address, this peer-to-peer -peer learning within the, the African region.